Welcome on board our 40-day journey on creating a new life for yourself. Um, as always, uh, we're excited to be here. We want to share so much with you because this amazing book is what we've been reading. I remember it's a 40-day plan. Today we are on day 21. Woohoo! We are excited. We actually did say we we're going to scream that poop, poop yesterday because that was day 20, which was halfway. But of course, day 21, we're absolutely excited to be carrying on with the plan that we agreed with you. And we're going to carry on and make it as exciting and interesting as possible. So um, we're trying our best to be live, but at least today we're on Instagram live. Um, and if you're on Facebook, please join us on Instagram whenever we come on uh we're recording this for youtube so at the end of this whole program you can always go on youtube even as we are go on youtube we have all the days day one day two and it carries on till today day 21 and we want to put everything on youtube which i am also going to be listening to it much later to make more sense out of this but we're hoping it's making sense to you because it is really making sense to us and now i keep using the words that i'm hearing from this book to remind me of things to do okay so today is protecting your church that's the topic of today's um chapter and again what i normally say to you is when you hear church which is where he is really coming from he's coming from the background of church um Keep thinking about your family, keep thinking about your community, keep thinking about your friends as well. And whenever you have this in, in, your, um, in your mind, you're going to find out that this makes more sense to you. Because if you're not a member of a church or you're not attached to any church and you're hearing all this church, sometimes you get confused and you say to yourself, but I'm not in any church, so this is not referring to me. But if you transpose that to mean your family, your community, your friends, then it makes a lot of sense. So protecting your church is the title. Uh, it, could, it could be protecting your family, protecting your community, protecting your friends. So normally he gives us some, some passages to look at and then after that he starts to talk about it. He said you are joined together with peace through the spirit. So make every effort to continue together this way. You are joined together with peace through the spirit so make every effort to continue living together this way and this is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 most of all let love guide your life for then the whole church will stay together in perfect harmony Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 and one of the biggest thing I took on from the last chapter chapter 20 was unity not uniformity and we should always strive for the better good of the whole the better good of the family the better good of the community the better good of the church so we shouldn't be focusing on are we all uniform we're not meant to be uniform the focus is unity so it is our job to protect the unity of our church that word comes again the unity of our family and the unity of our community. Unity in the church is so important that the New Testament gives more attention to it than either heaven or hell. So you know as Christians we're told about heaven and we're told about hell all the time. But it says unity is so important in church that the New Testament is talking more about unity than talking about hell or talking about heaven. God deeply desires that we experience oneness and harmony with each other. God wants us to have harmony with each other. And that's so important to God. Unity is the soul of fellowship or friendship. Destroy it and you rip the heart of Christ's body. It is the essence, it is the core of how God intends for us to experience life together. So being together it's so important to God it becomes the core of who we are it is the core of the church is the core of the community is the core of the family unity is so important to God our ultimate supreme model for unity is the Trinity and so he's given us a model from God's point of view of what he means by unity and we've heard of the Trinity over and over as a Christian what does that mean is God is God is um, God is son 
God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So this Trinity is always together, always together. You don't hear of God without the other two. And so if God can connect and stay together in this Trinity, that's the example he wants us to use where we're looking at our families, where we're looking at our friends, where we're looking at our communities and our church. They are unified in one. And so we must learn to, 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 to take the example of God. God himself is the highest example of sacrificial love, humble other centeredness and perfect harmony. Humble other centeredness, other centeredness. In the sense of when, when we become selfish, most people would rather call it self-centeredness. And so this is other centeredness. So God is more other centeredness than self-centeredness. And so just like every parent, a heavenly father enjoys watching his children get along with each other. Now think of yourself as a parent or you are a parent. I am a parent. And I know what it means when I see my children getting along with each other. That's the same message here. God wants to see us, who are his children, getting along with each other. In the final moments before being arrested, Jesus prayed passionately for our unity. It was one of the biggest prayers he, he gave for the unity of the church. It was our unity that was uppermost in his mind during those agonizing hours. Because, you know, when there's a leader and the leader is living, the natural thing that happens is chaos. There's a lot of confusion going on. And this is one of the examples, you know, remember when the Iraq, Iraq war and Iraq fell, Saddam Hussein was killed. And then we had uh, Muammar Gaddafi killed as well. There's, since then, there hasn't been peace in those two countries. Whenever a leader who had good grip over his people leaves, a lot of confusion comes through and that's what goes on here so christ was leaving us you know they were you know he was being arrested and was going to be crucified and all of that and his biggest worry was how are these people going to remain united for me so it was our unity that was uppermost in his mind during those agonizing hours this shows how significant this subject is to to our lord nothing on earth is more valuable to god than his church Nothing is more valuable because the church to God is the only place that he can have his children all connected together. He paid the highest price for it and he wants it protected, especially from the devastating damage that is caused by division, conflict and disharmony. So whenever uh, there's, no, there's no unity, what happens is disharmony, conflict, confusion. And God doesn't like that. Family, it is your responsibility to protect the unity where you fellowship. Again, remember, we're not talking about just church. Wherever you are, if you're God's child, your role is to protect the unity of that establishment, the unity of that group, the unity of that together, togetherness or friendship or family. We are commissioned by Jesus Christ to do everything possible to preserve the unity protect the fellowship and promote harmony in our church family. Same with our individual families. Bible says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And so when you create peace, you encourage unity in that place. The Bible gives us practical advice to do this. And these are the advice we're gonna be looking at. Focus on what we have in common. This is so important, not our differences. Remember what I read earlier, unity, not uniformity. So if we're focusing on what brings us together, what makes us great, what makes us amazing, this is so important to any gathering, any coming together of people. This is referring to countries as well. If we focus on what makes us one, then we will not be worried about what is differentiating us. So. It is so important that we look at the common good of that group. So Paul tells us, let us concentrate on the things which make for harmony. So we should be looking at what brings us together and on the growth of one another's character. What are the things that are going to help us grow? That's a big question. That is so important. 
and you remember how my own story started by reading this book I was at a point where everything was weighing me down and I had no clue where to run to and you remember one of the chapters he said it's so important that whenever you are stuck when you're lost when you have need when you're desperate to take your problem to God not to go and gossip to other people and so this was so important to me I started speaking to God and I was I was so confused I had nowhere to run to and a voice came and said but you have this book go and read it and that's how the whole thing came about and when I I told myself okay I'm gonna start reading this book then he said there may be people out there who are desperate for you know who want something sorted out in their life as well there might be lots of people out there with similar issues like you are having wouldn't it be nice if you go and share this message with them and that's how I decided to video this that's how I decided to document this because I know lots of us are extremely lazy about sitting down to read we're extremely confused about where to go and get help and I tell you this book has been one of my greatest help so far because there are so many questions I had and this book is answering them we are we're looking at the growth of the family the growth of the community the growth of the whole so why then do we allow selfish interest and self-centeredness to be what breaks us so that's the message that's coming out of this passage and the previous passage as well so Paul is telling us we should concentrate on the things which make for harmony and on the growth of one another's character. Again, me taking on this role was because I'm a Christian. And when I was beginning to get so much doubt in my head and so much confusion, questions were coming, what should I do? Should I just disintegrate and let go, let everything go bad? Or should I hold it together? And if I'm holding it together, how can I handle this? issues that were weighing me down and so going to God became the only solution and this has answered most of my my problems it's as far as I know I mean we haven't finished it remember it's a 40-day plan a lot has been dealt with already and I feel a lot lighter and I'm hoping if you were having any issues and you've been following me you're feeling as light as I'm feeling so as believers we share one Lord one body one purpose, one Father, one Spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one love, same salvation, same life, same future. Factors far more important than differences. So if you're a believer in God, there's so much we share. And uh, uh, you know, when we talked about meditation, like whenever we finish, a passage that came to my head the other day was, you know, though we are many, we share in one body. Now that is a huge one. That is so amazing because we come from one source, which is God. So we may be different, like the unity and non-uniformity. We may all have differences. We may all have things that make us individual, but we all share in one blood. And if you're Catholic, when you go and take your communion, that's the one thing, body of Christ, blood of Christ. So you are one. So why then do we allow differences to disintegrate us? So these are the issues, not our personal differences that we constantly concentrate on. So all these things that we talked about, the one, one love, the one body, the one purpose, the one spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism. These are the things we should concentrate on, not the things that separate us. We must remember that it was God who chose to give us different personalities. So whoever we are, God created us. And this also made me very happy because now I'm beginning to appreciate everybody in the person they are. I am no longer sitting here and wondering why is that person not like me? Why is that person not thinking like I was thinking? Why are you behaving the way you are when you should have behaved the other way? And so we understand that God created all of us and he chose to give us different personalities, different backgrounds, different races, different preferences. So we should value, we should value each other no matter how different we are and enjoy these differences and not merely tolerate them. So lots of us, when we bother to appreciate other people, we just tolerate them. 
oh yeah, I can only just tolerate. Oh, she's so noisy. She's so loud. She wears too much jewelry. She wears too much hair. I, I hear that. People tell me that. And then you hear, oh, she takes, puts on so much makeup. Why are you not quiet? I mean, it makes me laugh because this is an interesting one. My sister and I, we're so completely different. When I tie my hair tie, you know, typical Nigerian, when we tie the, um, our, when we go out to our parties, we tie the hair tie, we call it gele. And so I tie my gele really, really huge and loud. I'm a loud person in dressing. And then my sister is very, very quiet and she wants her gele to be as flat as possible. That's who we are. We are different people. So appreciating each other is what God wants us to do. Not to now sit in judgment and say, but why are you tying your hair tie so loud? And why are you making yours so small? We're just different people. And God wants it that way. God wants unity, not uniformity. For unity's sake, we must never let differences divide us. Feel free, write us, tell us what you are experiencing as well. Um, we like you to give us a nice shout out. We get that all the time. So it will be exciting to hear from you. So, God wants unity, unity, not uniformity. For unity's sake, we must never let differences divide us. We must stay focused on what matters most. We must stay focused on what matters most in our lives. I call it united we stand and divided we fall. Well, you know that saying. And it all comes together here. If you are united in whatever you're doing, I mean, there's a saying in my country, uh, there's some, we call it broom. And the broom is like a bundle. And there's a saying that you cannot break that broom. Why? Because it's a bundle, it's a lot together. But if you pull a strand of that broom out, you can just break it in seconds. And that's what it is. United, we stand because we're together. The minute we stay divided, we fall apart. So, Learning to love each other as Christ has loved us and fulfilling God's five purposes for each of us and his church. Further down, I think he explains this God's five purposes for us. Conflict is usually a sign that the focus has shifted to less important issues. Remember, he's given us the major things. But the minute you find yourself in conflict with anybody, watch out. The focus has moved from the important issues. And that's what causes conflict. So be watching out with your friends, with your family, in the church. Whenever there is a conflict, the, the bigger picture has been forgotten. We're now looking at the tiniest of ridiculous things. So um, it says conflict is usually a sign that the focus has shifted to less important issues. Things the Bible calls disputable matters. So these things that are less important, the Bible calls them disputable matters. When we focus on personalities, preferences, interpretations, styles, or method, divisions always happen. Remember what I just explained, you know, talk, explaining or describing my sister and I. This is where People then take attention from the main thing and they are focusing on, on personalities. They are focusing on preferences. They are focusing on interpretations. They are focusing on styles. They are focusing on methods. They are focusing on divisions. And all of this creates problems in groups. Um, I hear we are just running out of um, battery on our Instagram. What will happen we just... Um, put on another phone very soon once this goes up. So please don't go anywhere if you're there with us. Um, just stay peeled because we're coming right back on for you. So if we concentrate on loving each other and fulfilling God's purposes, harmony comes together. When we concentrate on loving each other and fulfilling God's purposes for us, harmony comes together. Harmony will be there. So Paul pleaded for this. Let there be real harmony so there won't be division in the church. Again, transpose this. Let there be real harmony in your family so there will not be division. Because if there's harmony and we're not concentrating on things that don't count, there will be peace in the family. 
I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. And so he goes further to explain this. Be realistic in your expectations. That's a big one. He wants us to be realistic in our expectations. So other be believers will disappoint, will disappoint you and let you down. But that's no excuse to stop fellowshipping with them. So again, now he's looking at the church uh, community. And so if you go there and other people stop interacting with you or stop fellowshipping with you, or um, he says other believers will disappoint you and let you down, but that's no. If they disappoint you and let you down, that should not be a reason for you to stop fellowshipping with them. So don't stop fellowshipping with people just because they are disappointing you. Stop! Don't stop believing in people just because they disappoint you. They are your family even when they don't act like it. So these people are your family even if they don't act like one. God tells us, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. So we should give a little bit of allowance for each other because we have love for each other. People become disillusioned with the church or with their community for so many reasons. There are so many reasons people give up on each other. There are so many reasons. And the list could be quite long. These are the reasons people give up. There's conflict, there's hurt, people are hurt. There's hypocrisy, there's neglect, there's pettiness, there's legalism, and the list goes on. So these are the reasons people get so fed up with it. And then they just become the solution and are no longer interested in that group. Rather than being shocked and surprised, we must remember that the community or the church is made of real sinners, which include us. That's a good one. Because it's just reminding us that there is nobody out there who is perfect. And so we should not be surprised to have these emotions going on around us whenever we are in a community. Remember, the biggest thing, one of the biggest message he gave us is we can never live in isolation. There is no martyr, there is nobody there in the Bible that lived alone. Because when you live alone, you can claim to be righteous. You can claim to be the best person that ever existed. You don't have any argument with anybody. Yes, because you're alone. But the minute you have to deal with people, it's only natural that after a long time of being together, there are things that will cause divisions. And this is where this heaviness starts to flow in. This is when people start to have issues in life. And this is when you start hearing people getting depression and getting disappointed and getting hot. And so being able to chat with other people helps. But this is a book that's really breaking it down for us. And so we want you to look into these issues that we're bringing up to you and then learn, learn and see how you can work around this for your own self and for your family. So he's saying that rather than being shocked, remember he just explained the list that could really cause disillusionment in communities. It says you feel conflict, you feel hurt. Somebody has hurt you and you really don't know how to express it. You feel there's hypocrisy going on here. You feel you've been neglected. You feel there's pettiness going on. He said all of this could be happening, but instead of you feeling shocked about this and surprised, we must remember that the community, whatever these communities are, being your family, being with your friends, being with, you know, in the church. He says, we are all made up of sinners. I remember this somewhere in the Bible where it says that if you say you have no sin, that you're lying. And so all of us have something. We've all, you know, come short of the glory of God. So because we all have something going on in our lives, all of these issues that he's mentioned is bound to happen. So we should not be shocked. Because we are sinners, we, we hurt each other. And in one of the chapters, he explained it. He said, for as long as you live with somebody for long enough, it's only natural, it happens, that we will hurt each other. And this is when it goes crazy, when you then feel hurt, and you build it, you hold it in your heart, and you start getting angry and querying and getting angry, that's when the pain starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, 
because we sinners we hurt each other sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally so these things happen it may just be unintentionally something went wrong and then you go oh my goodness he deliberately did this and this happens a lot with husband and wife best friends and best friends parents and children it is not intentional or even when even sometimes it is intentional we will feel that way we will feel hot and so but instead of leaving the church instead of leaving the church we need to stay and work it out and i'm reading this message very clearly when these things happen in marriages which was my experience instead of working out on the marriage sit in it and work on it that's what he's saying he said instead of leaving the marriage um leaving the church we need to stay and work it out and i'm reading it instead of leaving your best friend or okay i don't want to talk to her again or him instead of i don't want to talk to my child again because it's the worst thing that happened instead of i don't want to even talk to my husband again that's it we're broken sit and chat about it sit and resolve it and I feel good reading things like this because I was in that position where everything was draining me down and all the people I knew most of the people I knew were like yeah what are you still doing that if, I, if it was me I would have gone since what do you gain what, what are you going to gain still hanging in there but reading a book like this just breaks it down that that's just the way it is none of us are without sin and so instead of you to run out just because something someone has hurt you someone has you know become hypocritical towards you or neglected you or ignored you and you decide that's it i'm walking away you are not going to make god happy and so he says reconciliation not running away is the road to stronger character and deeper friendship reconciliation not oh yeah i've had enough i'm running out of here that is the road to reconciliation or better friendship reconciliation not running away is the road to stronger character and deeper friendship you remember he says whenever you sit together and discuss and talk about it you create a better bond than before than when you run away so divorcing your church he used the word divorce divorcing your church again divorcing your husband divorcing your wife divorcing your friendship it's not the answer at the sign of disappointment or disillusionment is a mark of immaturity so the minute there's there's disillusionment and disappointment and you say that's it i'm not going to that church again he says that's a mark of immaturity and so just turn that around to me in any any relationship you have running away is not the answer god has things he wants to teach us and others too and you remember that earlier passage where it says life is a test so whatever it is you're going through may just be a test that God's want, God wants to see how you're going to overcome this. Besides, there is no one perfect to escape to. He says there's no perfect church to escape to. So if you were running from one church and saying, yeah, because everyone there is so horrible and hypocritical and neglecting me and hurting me, let me run to another. There's no perfect one. Every church, every community, every person has his own set of weaknesses and problems. We all have our weaknesses and problems. And you will soon be disappointed again. So if you fell, yeah, let me run off and go to another place, you will be disappointed again there. Because it's just human nature. We are all sinners. And I have the example of Elizabeth Taylor. I mentioned it earlier in one of the chapters as well. And she got married to as many men as possible, but none of it lasted. Because this exact thing he's saying. If a church must be perfect to satisfy you, that same perfection will exclude you from membership. Because you are not perfect. I find that really interesting. He says if a church must be perfect, if you're looking for a perfect man, a perfect woman to get married to, he says just that perfection alone is going to exclude you from being part of that person because you are not perfect. So when we all run out there chasing perfection, we are not perfect. Then we're, we're going to be chased away by that perfection because we're going to meet a scenario where even we are not perfect. 
and, and he explains that this goes into everything. So for me, in marriage, it's the same thing. It must be perfect to satisfy you. That same perfection will destroy you and break up the marriage because you are not perfect. And he explains that there was this, uh, this German pastor who was martyred for resisting Nazis. And this man wrote, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The man wrote, a, he wrote a classic book on fellowship and life together. And this is what he said. He suggests that disillusionment with our local church is a good thing because it destroys our false expectations of perfection. So when we have disillusionment, it's good. Because then we no longer have that idea of perfection in our head. Same thing, disillusionment in marriage is good because there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Anybody out there, there was one of the chapters where it says people like to gloss over their life and pretend that nothing is happening there. There is no one person who has a perfect life because all of us have seen and have come short of the glory of God. I said, the sooner we go, give up the illusion that a church, that a friend, that a marriage must be perfect in order to love it, the sooner we quit pretending and start admitting we are all imperfect and need grace. The sooner we give up that illusion that everybody must be perfect, the better for all of us. Because now we will realize that we need grace from God, all of us. This is the beginning of real community. This is the beginning of real marriage. This is the beginning of real friendship. Understanding that nobody is perfect. Says every church could put up a sign. No perfect people need apply. This is a place only for those who admit they are sinners and they need grace and they want to grow. That would be fantastic if churches had that. Put a sign. No perfect human being welcome here. We all have sinned and we've come here to seek grace from God. So the next one, it says, choose to encourage rather than discourage or criticize. It is always easier to stand on the sideline and take shots at those who are serving than it is to get involved and make a contribution. So this happens again in so many relationships and so many communities. Whenever somebody has been put in a position to lead and make decisions, you see all those ones who are underneath picking on everything that person does. And this is a very good case with politics, especially, I mean, here in the UK, you find that there's not, nothing any government does as good. Everybody has something to say about it. That's the same thing he says about church leaders. So in every church, everyone wants to complain. God wants us over and over not to criticize, not to compare or judge each other. And so again, this can be turned around in our friendship. This can be turned around in our marriages. This can be turned around in our families. We shouldn't just sit out there and be judging people all the time and criticizing people. He so said, when you criticize what another person is doing in faith and from sincere conviction, you are interfering with God's business. So this is in the church now. If all you do when you go to church is just to criticize people who are in position, who are actually doing God's work, because they're doing it sincerely the way they know best, you're actually interfering with God's work. What right do you have to criticize someone else's servants? Only their Lord can decide if they are doing right. Paul adds that we must not stand in judgment or look down on other believers whose convictions di differ from our own. So when people decide, this is how I think something should be done, this is how I feel it should be done, we should not just sit there and judge it and think that because it's different from the way we look at it, it is wrong. Why then criticize your brother's actions? Why try to make him look small? So in relationships, why are we so quick at criticizing it, each other? We shall all be judged one day, not by each other's standards. That is another huge one. Because, you know, like I said earlier, we sit there and we expect that other people should be like us. Other people should think like we think. And that's what he's saying. Unity, not uniformity. No other person can be you. Because we've all been created differently. 
remember where we read about the races the you know the preferences the decisions the whatever makes you stand out that's who you are and so when we go and sit there and, and criticize it is wrong but we should remember that one day we're going to be judged god will judge us and when he judges us he's not judging us based on each other standards he's judging us based on who we are or even our own but by the standards of christ so god is judging us based on the standards of christ not on each individual's standards we generally live by our own standards our experiences our hearts our expectations our fears our worries our happiness our sadness all bringing rules etc when people de deviate from our standards we automatically judge them we criticize them we complain we get upset we get angry we take action because we have our expectations and this is what is guiding our decisions and our choices and our standards if only we can open our heart to accommodate everyone in their own way remember unity not uniformity an open heart that accepts diversity and that's where the world's problem is coming from we're not open enough to let people be themselves he said whenever we judge another believer four things happen we lose fellowship with god so when we judge somebody else we lose fellowship with god we expose our own pride and our insecurities so whenever we're judging people we're exposing our individual pride and our insecurities. We set ourselves up to be judged by God and we have the fellowship of the church. So it is something we really need to take in, into consideration. So a critical spirit is a very costly advice. And the Bible calls Satan the accuser of our brothers. So whenever we see ourselves criticizing and criticizing, it is more than just us we've allowed something else to take over from us it is the devil's job to blame and complain and criticize members of god's family so again when we find that spirit of critic criticism complain nagging moaning it is no longer what we should be doing it's something else taking over from us anytime we do this we're being duped into doing satan's work for him so that's the message so if you find yourself in that position where you want to criticize everything anybody does around you you're no longer in control you allow satan to take over he says remember other christians friends husbands and wives and sisters etc no matter how much you disagree with them, they are not the enemy. So whoever these people are around you, no matter how much you disagree with their point of view, they are not the real enemy in your life. And this was a very good one because I know most times like uh, coming from Nigeria, whenever anything goes wrong in the family, we look for anybody else to blame. Everybody else around us is responsible for you having headache. And I always wonder, where did this person come from to put this headache in your head? Because you've allowed your state of mind to carry so much. And the minute your cells are struggling to deal with whatever it is, you're going to have headache. And then what do you do? You turn and you blame somebody. No matter how you feel about other people, they are not your real enemy. Your real enemy is the ideas in your head. It's whatever you've allowed yourself to take on. Is there any time we spend comparing or criticizing other people our friends our family members these are time we should have been spending building the unity of our friendship or our fellowship remember in one of the chapters it explained to us that whichever way we look at it whenever there's a problem you decide do i want to compromise or do i want to complain do i want to fight and whichever way you decide you are still going to use energy so the energy you use to cause confusion, you could have also used it to solve the problem. The Bible says, let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. So why don't we aim to get along with each other instead of using that energy to, to create this massive wall? 
help others with encouraging words don't drag them down don't um don't drag them don't by finding fault don't that don't drag them down by finding fault so instead of picking on people we should look for ways of giving them encouraging words instead of dragging them down by finding fault in everything they do we should focus on what is important to our survival our unity and our growth and that was one of the first things he told us over and over so he says we should refuse to listen to gossip Gossip is passing on information when you are neither part of the problem nor, nor part of the solution. So we encourage gossip all the time. We know spreading gossip is wrong, but we should not listen to it either. Listening to gossip is like accepting stolen property and it makes us just as guilty of the crime. So when you listen to gossip, it's like you've accepted stolen property. This You shouldn't be taking this on because you're not going to solve the problem and you're not um, you're not part of the problem, neither are you going to solve it. So the minute you take on gossip, you are like someone who's gone receiving stolen property. And so listening to gossip, um, when someone begins to gossip to you, you should have the courage to say, please stop. I really don't want to hear this. Have you talked directly to that person? So if you have an issue with somebody, go talk to the person. Stop passing on issues and sharing this issue across so many people. People who gossip to us, we also gossip about us. That's a big message we should take on. Anybody that gossips to us will also gossip about us. So we're just slightly changing our phone right now because the battery life on one is gone. So anyone who gossips about us, I mean gossips to us, we also gossip around um, about us to other people. So we should be careful of such people. They cannot be trusted. If we listen to gossip, God says we are troublemakers. So when you sit down and you're listening to people telling you things about other people, you cannot contribute, you cannot help, you are a troublemaker because you're taking it on. And say so there are there are the ones who split churches. These are the people who split churches. These are the people who split communities. These are the people who split friendship. These are the people who split marriages. Because they only think of themselves. So be careful of listening to gossip or taking on gossip. Remember this most important one. People who gossip to you will also gossip about you. In Nigeria, there's a name we call people who gossip. Oh, thank you so much. Someone just said I'm so beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are equally beautiful as well. We are all beautiful souls. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy you're there watching this program. I hope this message we are bringing across is making sense to you and will help you in your life too. Thank you. It is sad. I was just going to tell you what we call gossip people in Nigeria. They are called Amebo. And is a long story but they are called Amebo because I was going to go into it and I just realized we haven't got much time. Um, it is sad in, that in God's flock the greatest wounds usually come from other shape not from wolves. This is so important and so interesting. Remember your enemies you, you think that you know as a sheep you think the enemy is the wolf and when the wolf comes it's going to devour you. But apparently the enemies are not the wolves. The enemies are other shapes. So what he's trying to say is that member of the church, that member of the family, that member, you know, part of your friends, uh, uh, friendship, they are the ones that are going to cause the problem. They are the ones that will come bringing in the gossip. And they are the ones that create the problem in the family. So it is fellow members and not enemies that are anywhere far away. And this happens in families like I just said. Not far, they are in the house. And they are the ones that will cause the distraction. Not the one that will unite the membership of that group. So Paul warned about them. He said cannibal Christians, that's what Paul calls them. Who devour one another. Remember how cannibals eat each other. And they destroy the fellowship. So we should be careful of people who, whenever you are in a group, 
are the ones who just want to talk and gossip. The Bible says this kind of troublemakers should be avoided. We should avoid these people. A gossip reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with them. The fastest way to end a church or a small group or a community or a conflict is to, is to lovingly confront those who are gossiping and insist they stop it. So, stop them before they carry on. Solomon said, fire goes out for lack of fuel and tension disappears when gossip stops. So, tension will disappear once nobody is spreading rumors. Did you hear that that one said that? And did you hear that she did this? And, you know, so if nobody is carrying on this way, tension stops. And so fire stops when there's no foil. So gossip is what is foiling the fire. He said, practice God's method for conflict resolution. So he's going to give us his way of how we can resolve conflict. In addition to the principles mentioned in the last chapter, which we're nowhere near the last chapter, he said, Jesus gave us so many ways. Jesus gave the church a simple three-step process. If a fellow believer or member of your family or your husband or your wife or your friend hurts you, go and tell him. If someone hurts you, go and tell the person. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. Remember, we've talked about this in another chapter where he says the best thing to do is come together and talk about it. When you do that, you become very good friends because the intimacy then de depends. He says, if he listens, you've made a friend. If he will not listen, take one or two other people along with you so that the presence of these wit witnesses will help keep things honest and try again. So I remember when I was having my issues with, you know, with my husband, I, I, we, we talked and talked and I still felt, no, my family must hear about this and family members were involved. And so he's saying these people then become witnesses. So if you still will not listen, then you need to tell the church. So if, you, if this is happening in the church, you get other people involved and then he's not listening. You tell the church, let the church know that this thing is going on between you and this person. He says, during conflict, it is tempting to complain to a third party rather than courageously speak the truth in love to the person you're upset with. And one of the chapters, he calls it, speak the truth in love. Because you're trying to create unity. You don't, you're not looking for any more problems. You're not trying to destroy the unity that's going on here. And so open up, be honest. And we talked at length about how this happens in one of the chapters it says this makes matters um during conflict it is tempting to complain to third party rather than courageously speak the truth in love to the person you're upset with so instead of talking directly to the person that's caused you this pain you go and tell the third party now this creates more problem that's what he's warning us about instead you should go directly to the person involved go directly to the person that's involved with this problem and talk to this person private confrontation is always the first step and should, you should take it as soon as possible then take others then take the church so if you know the processes is given us first talk to the person in love and it's not being solved then get other people involved it's not it's still not being solved then go to the church if it doesn't still listen then it is no longer your problem if this person does not still want to listen to you, is not ready to talk to anybody else, then it's no longer your problem. You cannot deal with this. You see, he challenges us to accept responsibility to protect and, pro um, and promote the unity of our church, of our community, of our family, and of our friendship. He wants us to promote the unity of whatever grouping we have. If we put our full effort into it, God is pleased. Whenever we put our effort in creating unity, God is very happy with us. It will not always be easy if you want to bring together unity. Sometimes we have to do what's best for the community or family body. So it's not always easy to create unity and peace, but we have to do what is best for the community. 
uh, and it says, not ourselves, not being selfish, but preference to others. That's the most important thing here. That's why God puts us in a community because he's testing us to see how we can handle this friendship, this relationship, this community. And then to say we instead of I. So once you're in a community, learn to say we. And our instead of mine. So remember to keep saying our instead of mine. God says don't think only of your own good. Think of other Christians or other people and what is best for them as well. So in this community, not only about your own good. So stop being extremely selfish if that's all you ever wanted to do. But think of other people. God blesses churches and families that are uh, unified. So once you are unified, once you're together, God blesses that group. What are your possible, what, what, what are you doing personally to make your church and your family more warm and loving? That's a question he's asking us now. Because we're gradually coming to the end. And there are more people in your community who are looking for love and a place to belong. The truth is, everyone needs and wants to be loved. And that's the honest truth. And this is the one thing that breaks relationships. This is the one thing that breaks families. This is the one thing that breaks friendship. This is one thing that breaks the church as well. People want to be loved. People want to be appreciated. And so the minute all of this disappears, then all these problems start to come in. So, this is where we're stopping today and that chapter is finished. But before we go, as always, we always ask the question and then we have our meditation. So the question was, what am I personally doing to protect unity in my church and in my family right now? What are you personally doing to promote unity in your church, in your family, in your friendship with your husband, with your wife, with your children, with your best friends, with your um, external families? What are you doing to protect that and to promote that unity? So it's a question we should ask ourselves and find answers to it. Because we need to do that. The minute we do that, God loves us. The minute we do that, God blesses us. Because he loves a unified whole. And the example he gave us was the Trinity. So if God can remain in one, why do we think we should act separately? And then the meditation was, let us concentrate on the things which make for harmony and the growth of our, um, and the growth of our fellowship together. And this is Romans chapter 14, verse 19. So as always, thank you so much for watching. And we really, really love being with you on this long, long 40-day journey. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And God bless you eternally.